Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Justification, Validation and Implementation, Best Practices for Multiplex Molecular Infectious Disease Tests. My name is Sarah and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. And live audience members can apply to receive a professional acknowledgement for continuing education, or PACE credit, issued by the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science through our exit survey at the end of today's session. At this point, I'd like to thank Nanosphere, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Nanosphere is dedicated to enhancing medicine by providing targeted and flexible molecular diagnostic tests that can lead to earlier disease detection, optimal patient treatment, and improved healthcare economics. Our platform, the Veragene system, enables clinicians to rapidly identify the bacteria and viruses responsible for some of the most complex, costly, and deadly infectious diseases. Currently, the Veragene test menu targets infections of the bloodstream, respiratory tract, and gastrointestinal tract. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Dr. McNabb performed his doctoral work in initiation of immune response, autoimmune disease, and vaccine development at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine and earned his degree in 1999. Dr. McNabb has been the Director of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Testing at New Hanover Regional Medical Center since June of 2012. Susan Sable manages the Microbiology and Molecular Department for Meridian Health at Jersey Shore University Medical Center in Neptune, New Jersey. In addition, she is a faculty member for the Florence M. Cook School of Medical Laboratory Science. She has 25 years of experience as a clinical microbiologist and is certified in infection control and prevention. Dr. Albee helps to direct the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Albee's area of focus are on implementation of new technology such as multiplex PCR assays and multitoff mass spectrometry. Specifically, Dr. Albee is aiming to use new technologies to test or, excuse me, identify resistant bacteria sooner, and the development and utilization of molecular tests to detect viral illness. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the presentation over to our first speaker, Dr. McNabb. And Dr. McNabb, you may start your presentation whenever you're ready. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, asking me to speak today, and I'm uh, very happy to do so. Um, I, I'm uh, currently working at New Hanover Regional Medical Center. I want to just give you a little bit of background about our hospital, so if you're of a similar size, you can kind of get a feel for what we're doing here. We're actually a 700-bed community hospital in a level one trauma center on the east coast of North Carolina. And uh, we are actually the south end, uh, almost to, to South Carolina. And our coverage range is around 120 miles north and south of our city and approximately 70 miles inland. Our hospital system includes Pender Hospital, Cape Fear Orthopedic Hospital, and we also have an outside emergency department north with um, two additional emergency departments uh, planned um, in the near future and potentially another hospital acquisition. We, um, we are a relatively large city here with about 150,000 uh, people in Wilmington. Um, we uh, currently do quite a bit of respiratory testing here at New Hanover. 
Um, we currently uh, own a Gene Expert Infinity, which during flu season we typically see around a thousand flu tests. Um, a month, with the exception of this year. This year has been a very light year for us, but over the last five years, we typically test around a thousand flu cases a month, and about 40 to 50 percent of those are positive. During flu season, we typically do around 200 uh, RSV per month as well. We uh, we test for influenza A, B, H1N1, and then we also uh, offer a Cepheid um, flu A, B combo with RSV. And our system is automated for the most part. It's semi-automated, and it actually auto-releases negative results, which is really great for our workflow here. Um, we do ship out other viral pathogens, for respiratory pathogens, and we looked at that last year to determine if we wanted some additional testing. We're shipping around 250 per year, and um, depending upon how many markers the physician orders, it can cost us anywhere from $300 to $600 which um, in a yearly rate just with that small volume can run us anywhere from $75,000 to $180,000 a year for additional testing other than flu, RSV, which we already offer in-house. And one of the, the differences here for at least our population is we have a very large pediatric population in Wilmington as well as an older population with 20 elder care facilities or other care facilities here just in our city alone. So clearly we were interested in getting some additional testing. Um, physicians were asking for it, specifically our pediatricians and our emergency department staff. Um, and then we have pulmonology here that were very interested in it as well. And one of the things that we really wanted was um, if we did, added this testing, was it going to allow us to do things like potentially not admit a patient um, for viral illness or defer an admission? Um, and then, you know, consider discharge if they've got a negative test or if they're in the ED, just, you know, not admit them. And then the real issue was, you know, if we did admit them to the hospital and they had another respiratory adenovirus potentially, uh, infection control would want to know about that so that we could, you know, put in place precautions so that we're not spreading the infection throughout the hospital, especially during flu season. Um, of course, you know, we have an administration like all large hospitals do. and the administrators are more interested in if we bring in a new test, they're worried about bringing in duplicate testing. Um, and, you know, when we offer a duplicate test here, you always have to verify that the, the test, if you're doing the same test on another platform, is performing similarly, which it adds an expense to the testing that you're already offering in-house. And um, adding an, an additional panel with a duplicate test is a problem if you run the duplicate because often, you can't get paid for that second test. You can't run a flu on one platform, run it on another platform, and get reimbursed. So there's always that concern if, with duplicate testing. And then, you know, the real question became from our administrators to, to, to the laboratory staff um, is how are we going to implement it and what are we going to do about the duplicate testing and how are physicians going to get the tests that they want without us running these tests on different platforms and increasing the workload in the laboratory. So, you know, the, the real, and another serious concern is always when you implement a new molecular test, there's always a concern about once you start the test that the number would go up. So we were currently knew that we were doing outside testing around 250 a year, but there was a big concern that if we offered it, that all of a sudden it would go up to 700 a year. So there were, so there were some concerns. Um, one of the things we already offered here at our hospital is we were already doing uh, using Nanosphere's Baragene system. And we've been using it for gram-positive blood culture and gram-negative blood culture. Um, and we've been doing uh, gram-positives for about, uh, this is our second year, just over two years. And our gram-negatives were over a year. And we've also added the enteric pathogens for just over a year now, too. So, um, and we do run these tests on all shifts every day of the week, and we call all positive results from all of these tests directly to clinical staff when we get the result. So, you know, one of the things that the administration here at least always considers is if we already have a platform, we're not duplicating platforms in the laboratory, and it also makes it a lot easier to train our staff since they're very familiar with that platform already in the laboratory. Um, one, so we looked at, because we had the system and we thought that we could make the argument for increasing our viral panel in-house, 
if we already have the system. And we looked at the Veragene RP Flex panel. And what it offered other than flu A, B, and RSV for us was adenovirus, which in an elderly population, especially in an elder care, you really would like to know if a patient comes in with that because you want like to limit and spread the spread of that infection, especially if it comes from an outside facility. And if it comes into the hospital, you'd be very interested as well, as well as paraflu. And then the one that we were most interested in, at least in looking at this panel, was in Bordetella pertussis, which is a bacterial pathogen. And we do culture for Bordetella here, but we understand, you know, collection is not ideal often. Transport is sometimes difficult. And we found that our culture for Bordetella is fairly is a fairly low uh, prevalence pathogen, at least with culture. Now we were very interested because with uh, with Nanosphere, we were able to discuss with them the option of getting a flexible pricing plan so that we could potentially pay for the parts of the panel that we were interested in. So the way that uh, that we envision that that would work for us is is uh, in looking at this slide, you can see sort of our costing for the Cepheid system, which is our high volume flu RSV uh, platform. Now, uh, the top part of the slide, just for the flu uh, A and B and H1N1, uh, this is approximate cost. It would be $50 to run that test in the laboratory. If you added RSV, it adds another $10, and you lose the H1N1. And so that's a $50 to $60. And so if, you, if the physician orders a flu without an RSV, and then they decide they want another RSV, we have to run that that particular panel and only and only highlight the RSV. So it can be expensive in those circumstances, but it doesn't happen very often. And then our culture cost, um, because we throw away a lot of plates, are around $65. And most clinicians for border pertussis, especially in pediatrics, orders out of our out of the hospital and they send it out for a molecular. Then, as you can see on the right side, the Veragene, you can order it as uh, sections. And you can pay for the sections that you actually release to the clinician. And we actually plan to implement this, this particular panel as a Bordetella pertussis panel. And that will be roughly $45. And that will be orderable by our clinicians. And then if they want other parts of the panel, uh, we will require they do uh, our larger platform in-house. And then we can add the other pieces that they would be interested in uh, and only pay for the piece that we report to the clinician. Um, when we look at bringing in new testing, our hospital really does not look at reimbursement as an incentive to bring it in. Just as a general rule in North Carolina for molecular testing, we get reimbursed about $48 per marker. Um, so our implementation plan for the Veragene was to run it just like our current system, run 24 hours a day and call positives to the ordering location. And then we were going to allow Bordetella pertussis to be orderable as a separate test panel by all clinicians. So any, any clinician that wanted it could order it within our system as an as individual panel. And then pediatric cases would be able to get a full panel on a case-by-case -case basis. And other areas, severe respiratory, would get it on a case-by-case -case basis. During the flu season, if, you, if they come in with respiratory, we were mandated, at least in our facility, that you'll run the higher volume platform and we would consider running other viral pathogens with a negative flu RSV test done on our other system. And we, um, and, and you know, and that, that took a lot of pushback, but we actually did get that approved here in our hospital. And then you can run the, you know, what we liked about the panel is flexible, you to run the ordered markers and then you can, if the physician needs to add markers that were on the panel, you could release those at a later time without rerunning the panel. So this, just to sort of summarize what I said, is how we plan to implement it. The Bordetella pertussis would be orderable for any physician during flu season. The Cepheid would be uh, our primary platform for flu RSV. And then off flu season, you could order uh, this panel as a flu RSV, other markers as needed with approval from the lab. So almost all of the other parts of the panel will be lab orderable, which clinical staff, you will get some pushback from that. But we feel like to make it cost effective for our hospital, this was the best way to manage it. Now, um, with any new test you have to verify, um, there's always a confusion between verify a test and validate a test. And we use the uh, Cumatech definition, the 
CAP definition, um, CLSI, which is verification is used to determine if a test works as it's designed to work, unmodified as it's FDA approved, and then validation is what you do to a test if you make any modification to the test, such as specimen type or you know any other change to the test as it was originally FDA approved. So we verify all new testing here in the laboratory. It's a one-time process. You do it up front. Uh, we typically will do this uh, very early on, sometimes during, mostly during training, and it's an abbreviated process just to make sure that the test uh, performs according to what the FDA assessed when the test was originally approved, and it can be any type of test, waived, moderately complex, or highly complex testing. You always, uh, when you would need to verify a test, uh, do verification is any kind of new test to your uh, to your test menu. Any additional system, so if you added a new system that's separate from a system, even if you already have that system, you'd always verify that that system performs the, the way it's supposed to. And the minimum requirement generally is 20 specimens, 10 positives, 10 negatives. We generally do more than that. Um, a lot of hospitals, that's just what they do. And then we generally do a 20-day QC. Um, we do it before running patient specimens so that it doesn't have to be consecutive days. Um, that just makes it easier that we don't have to restart if you miss a day of 20-day uh, QC. So, um, and you know, and we generally will do this concurrent with training and uh, developing our procedures for the new test. And um, we always do a comparison of old testing to new testing if we're replacing a method. Um, and really the purpose is to just characterize that the test works as advertised, um, where you can see errors with staff performing the test. And, you know, uh, our accreditation uh, cap requires that you do this process, so we always want to be in compliance with our accreditation agencies. And, you know, one of the biggest problems is identifying differences when you compare culture to molecular mass spec to culture or another method. So you always want to compare these differences and look for that to see how they perform compared to each other. And you just want to make sure the test provides consistent results. Um, and you're always going to have discrepant results, and you're going to have to account for them. The biggest problem we've had, at least at New Hanover, has been molecular comparison to culture. And I've written document after document to explain, you know, to our medical director and others that approve these things, why they're different and why we should accept it, even though the, the correlations or the comparisons sometimes don't look too good. Um, you know, we generally conclude that molecular testing is superior to and much more sensitive and specific than culture, but your, your, uh, in your organization it may be different, um, but that's how we do it here. Um, you know, and then what are you going to do when you've got molecular positive but culture negative, and we have that quite often here. Um, the samples you should get should be patient specimens. Um, we generally collect those when we know we're bringing in a new methodology, but you can, you can get proficiency material, you can use um, survey material, um, you can, there's a lot of ways you can do it, and vendors may be able to provide specimens for you to do verification of this assay. Um, and then often that um, vendors will have these, or they'll know people that have these, and they'll have procedures or protocols in place for you to use to do verification. Um, here is our multiplex assay um, that we were just talking about, the FLEX, and this was our 20-day QC that we set up. And we do mostly flu and RSV during flu season, so we wanted to make sure that that performed acceptably. So we had collected up quite a few flu and RSV, and then we ran a, a certain number of uh, adeno and metanulovirus paraflu. And this was sort of our schedule that we set up for the tech, so they knew what to run each day of the 20-day QC, and uh, we got acceptable results there. And we varied it around a little from this. This was actually our plan, and of course, as everyone knows, the plans don't always go as well as you'd like. And then this was um, the comparison between our nanosphere and Cepheid for both flu and RSV. And you can see we had it matched up fairly well. This is a positive negative uh, molecular result. And we had uh, it matched pretty well. We did have a couple of discrepancies in the flu, and uh, that was to be expected because these were frozen samples that we had saved to run on the new system. And then we do EP evaluator to compare that, and that will give you a score to tell you how much in agreement the test is. And this was just looking at influenza A. 
We actually did it for B and RSV as well. And this is just part of our documentation system. And then uh, you can go to Nanosphere and they can provide you a panel. And this is an example of one of the panels they provided to us if you would like to evaluate the test further to make to verify that it actually can detect everything that is on the panel. And they, sent, they can send this set. And as you can see here, it covers all the markers. And you can, you can use this set as your 20-day QC as, and also as part of your verification. And, um, and we like this panel uh, too, and we also ran this in addition to the other, uh, mark, the other panel that you had seen, or the other uh, schedule you had seen. So we here at New Hanover, um, if you couldn't tell, we really like uh, molecular testing. We've been very successful bringing it in, and we really do love the, this, this fuller panel for respiratory pathogens. It fills a need that especially pediatricians in the emergency department staff thought that we needed. Um, it does include uh, bacterial targets, which are of interest. We would like to get out of the Bordetella pertussis culturing uh, business here, and I think that that will be down the road in the future. We'll do that with this panel. Um, we like the flex pricing, um, which allows us to only pay for the markers that we're interested in releasing. And, um, you know, this more rapid testing, especially calling of the positive results, has allowed our clinical staff to make decisions on whether or not the patient needs to be admitted to the hospital or not. And we found with, you know, with our enteric panel as well, using uh, calling positives to the emergency department has allowed us to determine if they need to be in the hospital or not. And we think our respiratory panel will allow that to happen as well. And that uh, assists us with saving money, which is one thing you do need to go to the administrators with once you start this kind of testing and sort of track those kind of things so that it's a little bit easier if you want to bring something else in. So we've been very happy with this test and we're very happy with the way the pricing's worked and that has allowed us to bring this test in at our facility. And so um, with that, I would like to uh, turn the talk over to Susan Sable who will be following me and then I'll be available at the end of the talk for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to start out with saying greetings from the Jersey Shore. My name is Susan Sable, and this portion of the webinar will be focusing on blood cultures. Um, just like my predecessor, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information. My team here consists of 29 technologists and three lab assistants. We provide molecular testing over three shifts. We are a core microbiology, immunology, and molecular laboratory for five medical centers within the Meridian Health System. This gives us a total of 1,200 beds. And one fun fact is we are serving the coastal communities of the New Jersey Shore. And according to Google Maps, we are approximately 2.3 miles from the nearest beach. Over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to incorporate a variety of platforms for molecular testing. These include Cepheid, Veragene, BDMAX, and the BioFire. Sorry, technical difficulties. So on the next slide, I'd like to start out with why did we decide to implement molecular testing for blood cultures? First of all, our current technology that we were using was the PNA fish. The PNA fish was very simple and very limited. Multiplex assays offer a greater variety of bacterial identifications and the addition of resistant markers. Resistant markers offered us the next step to guide antibiotic therapy sooner and to improve the management of our patients with sepsis. Justifying the cost of a molecular system for blood cultures can be a bit harder, as cost savings are not usually associated with the laboratory, such as decreased length of stay and antibiotic stewardship. So one of the first things we did was we invited our infectious disease physicians, infection control, and pharmacy to educational sessions provided by the vendors. These people were instrumental in speaking up for the need to provide these assays to our administration. 
So we began looking at two systems and we reviewed the Veragene and the BioFire. For those of you that are not familiar with the BioFire, I would just like to let you know that the BioFire is a single assay system offering gram-positive, yeast, and gram-negative identifications in a single pouch. Veragene, on the other hand, is based on gram stain results then the selection of a gram-positive or gram-negative assay. So as you can see by this slide, the assays do vary. BioFire includes yeast, but Veragene provides a greater variety of gram-positive organisms. The resistant markers for both of these assays are pretty much equivalent. Comparing the gram-negative assay, the bacterial identifications were relatively equal but there is a greater number of resistant markers that were available in the Veragene assay. So after reviewing both of these systems, we came to the following conclusions. Both systems were definitely equal in quality. They provided us the results that we needed. Uh, the Veragene system was based on gram stain. When it came to time of detection, it was 60 minutes for the BioFire as compared to 150 minutes for the Veragene. However, the Veragene's assay was more in line with our patient population. And this included the resistant markers as well. As far as cost, when we compared the cost to the PNA fish that we were currently using, we did come out with a cost neutral to our budget, which again made this much easier to get our administration to approve. So once we began the process, the first part of the process, of course, is verification. So for performing verification on blood cultures, we did a 20-day study. And through the 20-day study, we processed positive blood cultures. We did the gram stain. We did the PNA fish. We added the additional PCR assay. And then we compared the PCR assay to our routine culture and susceptibility results. We then took a look at the data and made sure it included the following. Inclusion of all the targeted bacteria and resistance markers and non-targeted items such as common skin contaminants, other gram-negative rods, and especially organisms listed in the package insert which had cross-reactivity. This accounted for approximately 90% of our verification data. The rest of the verification included simulating blood cultures. So we inoculated blood culture bottles with expired red blood cell products from our blood bank and targeted specific organisms that we did not find during the 20-day study. They were, the blood cultures were placed into our automated instruments. When they were flagged positive, we went through the same process, gram stain, PNA fish, the PCR assay, and routine culture, and compared our data. At the end of that, we still had a few things that we were missing, so then we relied on manufactured panels such as the Zeptometrics panel. Additionally, quality control needed to be addressed. It should be noted that quality control for large multiplex assays differs from other testing. To my knowledge, there's not a single positive control which includes all the targets. However, CAP has standards that just does allow for the use of representative controls and rare targets can be rotated over the quality control interval. So in 2015, this was our current QC plan. We did a 20-day continuous quality control using the CLS guidelines. From there, each target was run with each new lot and shipment. Representative controls are then run every 31 days. The rare markers that we had were rotated and run at least yearly. And additionally, of course, the internal QC needed to pass for each test cartridge. However, at the end of 2015, equivalent QC was no longer acceptable. And we needed to come up with another plan. We, could ha we had the option of performing daily QC or implementing an individualized quality control plan. Daily QC would take a lot of time, and according to our calculations, it would leave little time to do any patient testing, so we opted to go with an IQC plan. So after reviewing CMS guidelines, 
the ASM and CAP website and listening, and listening to webinars much like this, I came to the following conclusion. First of all, I needed to keep the plan simple. I could look at manufacturers' templates, but I could not rely on them solely, and they are definitely a very good place to start. I needed to include all of my historical QC data to support the frequency of my testing, and I could not go below the manufacturer's recommendation. And I can say yes, secretly, I am definitely grateful that the PCR equipment doesn't move around the building, much like point of care. So, how do we go about creating an IQC plan and keeping it simple? So I like to remember the 353 rule, which includes the following. The three phases of testing, your pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical testing. Next is your five elements, and the five elements include specimen quality, training and competency of your testing personnel, monitoring of your test reagents and the environment, and monitoring your test system, which should include instrument calibration, maintenance, and function checks. Lastly, you want to include the three mandatory items. This is your risk assessment, your quality control plan, which is all the details, and not to be forgotten is oversight and assessment of the plan. Examples of this include evaluation of errors as related to the three phases of testing, corrected reports as related to testing, and even complaints regarding the quality of testing. So how can we do this risk assessment effectively? One method is a failure mode and effects analysis, or as commonly called FEMA. A FEMA approach simply identifies potential failures with products or processes. It is a method of determining and defining risk. It usually uses a very simple grading system to, to achieve a risk index score. It's best used to, as a team approach. No one individual may come up with everything in the risk, so using a team approach is definitely a benefit. And lastly, by using a FEMA approach, you will have consistency in your risk assessment. So defining your risk. The first thing you need to do is define the probability of frequency or occurrence. Okay, and this is where historic, historical data comes into play. And as you can see here, I clearly defined in my definitions what my frequency of risk is and gave it the simple scoring system of one through five. Next, we defined the consequences. Again, the consequences were giving a score of one through five and defining them from the catastrophic, a serious, irreversible event or death of a patient, all the way to one being no injury to the patient and just maybe possible longer treatments over the course of time. On the next slide is an example of a scoring table for the pro for risk assessment. Okay, this is done by multiplying your probability of occurrence score or frequency score by your consequence score. In this example, my approved acceptable risk is a score of one to four as seen in the green and a score of 15 or greater is considered unacceptable. Scores of 15 or greater can be taken down to a lower level if you take further action to implement, and again, you would rescore yourself, and therefore you would be able to get through this. One of the most valuable resources I found for getting through an IQC plan is located right on the CAP website. The document that I have shown here defines the IQC requirements and citations. I think this is a great tool for self-inspection. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with the following. Um, this is a case that we have seen in our laboratory over the last year a number of times. And I would like to also relate this to an IQC plan. So on day one, our instrument flagged a blood culture. We processed it and found that the gram stain revealed gram positive 
cocci and clusters. We ran our Veragene PCR assay. We had Staph aureus detected and the MEK-A marker detected. We sent a preliminary report to the physician to the floor and we notified infection control that we had a blood culture that was identified as methicillin resistant Staph aureus by PCR. However, the culture during the course of the next two to three days revealed the following, that it was mixed with colonies of Staph aureus and coag negative staph, and the susceptibilities did not, re did not match our PCR assay. The Staph aureus was susceptible to oxacillin and cefoxidin, and the Staph epidermidis that was located in the was oxacillin resistant. So therefore, the MEK-A did not, marker did not belong to the Staph aureus. At this time, a corrected report was sent to the physician. So over the course of year, when it came to monitoring our corrective reports for PCR, we noted the following. We had three occurrence of MEK-A detection involving mixed cultures, all three of which the MEK-A did not belong to the Staph aureus and a corrective report had to be issued. We had one occurrence of cross-reactivity involving Staph species, and this is a limitation as noted in our package insert. So we had run a total of 6,240 Veragene assays with four occurrences of corrected reports, giving us a rate, a corrected report rate of 0 0.06. And when I put it into my risk index score, I got a risk index score of four. So this is something that I monitor on a monthly basis as noted by the CAP standard COM.50600. So in conclusion, I'd like you to remember the following. First of all, be prepared. Mixed cultures will happen. Education of both the technologist and the clinician prior to implementation will greatly increase everyone's confidence in PCR results. I'd like to give out a shout out to my great team of microbiologists who make it happen at the Jersey Shore, and thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. And now we will move on to our final presenter, Dr. Albee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on the, this webinar and thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit today about how to justify your decision to multiplex. I'm going to spend uh, the majority of my time focusing on stool testing. So we're aware that there are a large number of hurdles to multiplex testing. Uh, there's a number of laboratory costs, which include both capital equipment costs and reagent costs for these assays. But there are also, and we must always be cognizant of, patient costs. So there's typically increased charges for molecular assays compared to traditional methods. That's great for the hospital, maybe not as great for the patients. Additionally, those patient costs can lead to hospital costs, not directly, but indirectly. And what do I mean by that? Well, if patients are dissatisfied, they fill out uh, surveys and then they've reflect their dissatisfaction on those surveys, which gives the hospital lower ratings. Uh, and then no hospital likes bad press. So we need to start out to do we really even want to multiplex? And when we're thinking about stool testing, do we even want to do stool testing? Well, we all know that stool cultures take a significant amount of technologist time for a relatively low number of positives. So data from our institution would suggest we have a positivity rate of about 4% depending on time of year. However, regardless of whether a culture is positive or negative, it takes us about 10 minutes to work up a culture. So if you look at our overall volume of about 200 stool cultures a month, if we can save just five minutes per culture, we're saving between 15 and 20 hours per month. This means less overtime, more time for development and validation, or just helping out others in a busy laboratory. So it's great for the lab, but is multiplex stool testing good for patients? And so looking at a study done in 2014, 
uh, this group looked at about 400 stool samples that were collected over a two-month period. All of these requests had bacterial culture, and then they did either real-time PCR for viruses or parasites, depending on whether or not that was requested by the physician. However, all samples got an, a, a, a broad-based molecular panel. So the, based on what the physicians ordered, uh, about 10% of uh, those samples were positive. Uh, using kind of that standard algorithm, and all were detected by the molecular assay that these people were uh, comparing their standard algorithm to. Importantly, there were 43 additional positives that the molecular panel picked up. So based just on what the physicians were ordering, it was not enough to detect, you know, it only detected half of the potential infections, you know. And one of the questions when you start to see these types of results is, well, is it just that the molecular panel's wrong? You know, is it really actually detecting true pathogens and things like that? Uh, so three quarters of those were able to be confirmed by uh, a secondary method, uh, but there were some notable discordant targets. So now that we've established that it's good for the lab, uh, and it actually might be good for patients, how do we go about justifying a multiplex panel? Uh, there are a number of business arguments that we've talked in brief about, and I'm going to delve a little bit more depth into. Uh, and this is looking at reimbursement versus cost. You know, and as Dr. McNabb pointed out earlier, uh, it really helps if you already have the equipment needed on board. And then also, as was touched on previously, are you replacing some current offerings? Are you doing some pathogens? Uh, that are you sending out some tests that would be covered by these panels? You know. Also, we hope to think of the patient first, and so that we need to think about these clinical arguments. You know, do we see an increased rate of detection, or are there other benefits potentially for infection control? So we know that these molecular assays de uh, detect more pathogens, and so we have an increased rate of detection, but also that we can replace methods with poor performance. So it is very well documented that uh, immunoassay methods for enteropathogens such as Campylobacter and rotavirus are commonly used, but they have very poor performance compared to culture. And so if we can replace those methods with a uh, more sensitive and more specific method, we're doing better for the patient. Ultimately, though, we need to get, the, get this past our administrators. And so there's a couple of approaches to a business argument. Uh, probably the more common uh, business argument is reimbursement, and that's that multiplex panels will tend to have a higher reimbursement than your standard culture methods. So, and that stool testing tends to be on outpatients, which typically means more money for your healthcare system. But an important question to consider is what is your payer mix? If you don't have a large group of payers who uh, will support multiplex testing, then this argument may actually not work. Alternatively, if you do not have a large outpatient base, if you are a specialty hospital or a specialty institution that deals primarily with inpatients, uh, you may not see that large outpatient base that's typically needed to justify the expense. And so then you need to start thinking about things like blood, how we approach blood cultures, where what are the savings to the institution, even if it is more costly for me to implement this technology in my laboratory. One of the ways to do that is to look at cost reduction. So again, you may look at your send out menu. Are you sending out aspects of stool testing, for example, viral, culture, viral, viral PCRs, uh, that you send out at you know, 50 or $100 a pop? Um, or you know, are some of those panel members done infrequently? Shigatoxin or rotavirus you know, EIA, where you may be only doing a handful of tests a year with very expensive kits. Uh, and spending more time doing QC on those kits than actually doing the tests. Finally, again, looking at the entire picture, what, how can we help the health system? So I have a couple of studies looking at the effect of multiplex panels in the infection control groups. So in this study published in 2015, they looked at the effect of multiplex panels on 800 hospitalized patients. They first calculated how much would it cost to go ahead and actually implement uh, multiplex testing, and it would actually cost that institution about $30,000 to implement multiplex testing on these 800 patients. So now they knew the point at which they, their kind of break-even point. If they couldn't save $30,000 in infection control costs, it wasn't going to be going to be good for the hospital. 
However, they found if they, if they modeled this, that if they discontinued isolation in patients who tested negative by this multiplex panel, then they would reduce their isolation costs by $90,000. And so ultimately the hospital would save approximately $60,000. And so this was an argument used for this group to justify bringing it into their, ho their hospital without considering outpatient reimbursement or outpatient payer provider at all. Another group looked at 158 inpatient diarrheal specimens that were negative already for, for common pathogens such as C. diff and rotavirus. Importantly, they found that over 20% had additionally another agent discovered and that a lot of these patients were never placed on isolation. So this is kind of the counter argument where if you're not doing multiplex testing and you have negative C. difficile or rotavirus, these patients still could be harboring uh, organisms, you know, think of something like norovirus that could actually cause uh, small outbreaks within the hospital. So that's great from the hospital perspective, but what about patient con and controlling patient costs? Well, one thing that, you know, we thought about when looking at this is we actually might already be charging our patients a substantial amount for their stool workup. So if you look at CPT coding for uh, a standard stool culture, it's 87045, but that really only covers Salmonella and Shigella. You get another, another CPT code for each additional stool culture plate. So if you add a Campylobacter plate, if you add, uh, if you add a, uh, a TCBS or Vibrio, anything like that, you get to add on another CPT code. But if you're doing Shigatoxin EIA, well, there's another CPT code. If you're doing Rotavirus EIA, there's another CPT code. If you're detecting norovirus by molecular, there's yet another CPT code. So you could potentially be working up your patients for a, 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 and charging your patients actually an amount that's close to uh, what you're already doing um, with a molecular ass with a multiplex panel. And so actually it could end up being cost neutral for your patients depending on your practices. Okay. So now that we've decided that we can justify how this works and get this get this get a multiplex panel into our laboratory, how do we know which one to choose? You know, it's it's kind of the the, the problem of you know there's too many choices. How do we know it's best? We only get to do this once. Well, you need to know your patient population first and foremost. If there are uh, panels that have uh, have pathogens on it that your patient population never sees then you may not, that may not be the best panel for your laboratory. And, and most importantly, you need to be able to kick the tires on that panel. You need to si figure out how that works in your hands in your laboratory. No laboratory is the same as the laboratory done that did the clinical trials and the FDA trials for these, and so it's going to behave differently in your laboratory. You know, we can expect that any FDA cleared panel is going to be very good at detecting what they're supposed to do. You know, so we know that they're going to, in the case of stool panels, we know they're going to detect their salmonellas and their shigellas and their campylobacters. But are they detecting too much? Are we seeing too many false positives, either from contamination in our laboratory or low-level colonization of patients? So one way you can look at that is kind of semi-prospectively look at samples that are negative by your core methods and see, do you believe the comparative results? All right, and so all, in our trial, we looked at about 60 samples that were negative uh, by our current methods and found three samples that were positive uh, by the panel but negative in our routine workup. Uh, two of these were norovirus, uh, positive for norovirus, which were not tested in our initial kind of workup. Uh, so we sent them for a second molecular assay and did confirm that indeed there was norovirus present in that sample. We also had one Campylobacter positive uh, that we never were able to recover in culture. Looking at the clinical history of this patient, however, this patient had previously received antibiotics uh, before presenting kind of for prolonged diarrhea. And so it made sense to us that this actually could be just a case of detecting dead organism, but that really Campylobacter was the cause of this patient's gastroenteritis. But we were also faced with the question of what to do if our patient, if our panel doesn't have what we need. So there's no FDA cleared panel that contains Aeromonas species. At our institution, about 8% of our positive stool cultures are positive for Aeromonas. And so we didn't want to lose the ability to detect and report Aeromonas. So how we've, how we've adapted is that we still set up a blood auger plate on every culture to look for Aeromonas. 
So yes, we're still setting up stool culture to an extent, but all we're doing is setting up a blood agar plate looking for hemolysis as opposed to picking and screening colonies off of, off of Hectoin or McConkie. And it allows us to finalize our negatives at 24 as opposed to 72 hours waiting for that Campylobacter plate. One thing that will be interesting to see is in the future is how this affects public health. So in this study from a couple of years, couple of, looking at data from a couple of years ago, but really before the advent of multiplex molecular testing, we saw that approximately 6% six six of uh, positive samples reported to FoodNet were actually due to uh, either, in this case, immunoassay positive, but culture negative or culture not done samples. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see going forward, are we going to lose the ability to type isolates that, you know, are not being reported or, or provided to the to public health? And so in our laboratory, what we do uh, is we actually culture any positive sample uh, to see if we can get an isolate both for susceptibility testing in our lab, but also to provide it to our public health colleagues. What we found is that we still detect a, and are able to recover a large number of positive samples. So in this graph, uh, we're looking at all of our different analytes, uh, as well as kind of the frequency in the blue are those that were culture positive and the red are culture negative. And so for all of these analytes, we did have a couple of cases uh, where we were unable to recover the organism, uh, but in the majority, we, we were still able to recover an organism to be provide both to public health and provide susceptibility testing. Looking at our data for two and a half months, uh, we've done nearly 600 cultures. Uh, we had a nearly 10% positivity rate. Uh, you know, 37 of them were bacterial positives, and we recovered uh, 26 of them. So if you look at how many we recovered, it's 4.4% of our total number of cultures we, we, we were able to recover as bacterial. And that's actually right on our historical positivity rate. So we're actually detecting a few more uh, pathogens, both bacterial as well as also detecting some viral targets that we were missing before. So we've, we've essentially doubled our positivity rate um, by detecting things that we couldn't detect previously. So in summary, uh, multiplex testing does offer increased detection of stool, stool pathogens. Uh, there may be some infection control benefit and definitely saves time in the laboratory. Uh, make sure to thoroughly investigate any new panel because you will find positives that were not there before and you have to be comfortable with what you are reporting. So with that, uh, I think we are going to now open up the uh, webinar to questions to the panel. Great. Well, thank you very much to uh, Dr. McNabb, Susan Sable, and Dr. Albee for their insightful presentations today. Uh, now I would like to invite our audience to continue sending in their questions or comments using the questions window uh, for this, which is the Q&A portion of this webinar. And I have already received some questions, so we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, this first question, uh, I believe this is for all the speakers. Speakers. Based on the current budget system, many hospitals have difficulties implementing molecular tests and maintaining the cost. Uh, in that case, what is the best advice for small hospitals with a limited budget? Um, well, this is, uh, this is Dr. McNabb. I would say that um, that was one of the barriers we had at our hospital with implementation of molecular testing. Uh, when we first started uh, back in 2012, um, reimbursement back then was poor for that test and, and, the, and the test we wanted, and it was, it was expensive. And what we've been able to do is I think a key is in how you implement the test. Um, for us, you know, we implemented enteric panels um, here, molecular, and we called the results to the clinicians, especially in the emergency department, which I'm sure that most people that implement that test perhaps do, do not do but it allows our cl clinical staff to actually make a clinical decision uh, for that patient before they're admitted to the hospital and whether they need to be admitted or not admitted. And we collect that kind of data to show the hospital the impact that this kind of testing can have. Um, it is expensive, um, but I think that the faster result has a lot of good clinical impact. The problem is, is you'll have to 
gather that data to show your administrators, um, especially after you implement the test. This is Dr. Albi. Uh, another thing is to you know start small with a, something that you is, are likely to have success with, uh, and then use that as justification for expanding your molecular testing abilities. And so so start with a small group, maybe a pilot group. Uh, where you're likely to show success and then use that as justification for bringing on additional testing. And this is Susan Sable. I would like to say the same thing. Um, cost savings with this rapid turnaround time, you know, you need to convince administration that you're going to decrease the length of stay and you're going to save costs by getting the patients on the right antibiotic in a short period of time. Okay, great. Thank you um, for those answers. The next question came in during Dr. McNabb's presentation. Uh, did the choice to call all positive results create any logistical problems? Uh, how do you deal with calling out patient positive results during off hours? Um, that's an excellent question, and I will tell you that um, my staff, when we first started calling um, positive blood cultures, we started gram-positive molecular blood culture ID first um, a couple of years ago, and we uh, we call all blood cultures anyway, but we typically call it to the floor. So we uh, then decided we were going to call to our pharmacists. We have in, in hospital pharmacy staff, and we call to them. So yes, when you when we implemented, we found calling and getting actions done with the results resulted in a, a much better outcome for the patient and much greater savings to the hospital. Um, there, the logistical problems will include whether you have the staffing to support that. And then certainly we do a good number for our enteric panel. We're doing about 60% outpatient work with that. And on those positives, you have to call somebody that's not in the facility and leave a message to make sure that they get that. And that, that has been a little bit of a challenge, but we work with our providers that have privileges on getting uh, ways to get them, and we've implemented a system that does that. But I will tell you that when you initially do that thing, uh, do work with calling uh, a lot of these positive results, there's a lot of pushback from staff. But I will tell you now that we've been doing it a few years, they're very used to it. They know how to contact providers. And I will tell you that the physician staff especially responded very well to this, and we've had a tremendous success. And so we're, we're planning to call our, we do call our, our respiratory panel as well. Um, and the physician staff, now that we do it, I think that if we tried to stop, it would be probably a riot in our facility. <laughs> okay, great. Um, another one for you, Dr. McNabb. Have you demonstrated any improved outcomes, such as decreased length of stay, um, a decrease in antibiotic use, decreased mortality, or decreased health care costs? Well, we, we haven't collected that data on our respiratory panel. Um, because we've just started that this year, um, and it's, it's still a bit, very short time, but we are collecting some of that data. I will tell you for our gram-positive blood culture and our gram-negative blood culture um, that we implemented uh, two years ago, that the length of stay for all of our positive blood culture patients went from an average of 17.5 days down to 10.1 um, days. So we decreased it, um, you know, that far, and, and we decreased five days the first year we implemented it, and in the second year with gram negatives, it actually went down a little further. And um, we haven't seen any difference in mortality in our sepsis cases, but we have seen a tremendous reduction in length of stay for all of our patients with positive blood cultures. Um, and we have reduced our vancomycin use for gram positives. Um, roughly the first year was around a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and then this year, the vancomycin reduction was even further, another 300000 plus we reduced colistin about $25,000 this year. So there are very positive benefits. The problem you're going to run into is you have to collect this data and then present it to your administrators to show that this kind of testing is very cost effective. Okay, thank you for that. Um, for Dr. Albi and Dr. McNabb, um, how do you get providers to order molecular testing instead of a traditional stool culture? Are both orderable tests? Uh, so uh, this is Dr. Albi. We actually replaced uh, stool culture with the enteric panel. Uh, so they cannot order, if they actually order stool culture, we, re we do the molecular panel and we sent out essentially a notification to all providers that that's what we were doing. Uh, and that if they had specific questions or comments, they could direct it to the laboratory 
uh, in case there maybe is a specific case or someone that they want to talk about potentially still doing culture on. Um, and uh, this Dr. McNabb, well, that's exactly what we did here. We replaced stool culture with enteric panel. Um, and then we did, we do do culture for Plesiomonas aeromotus. Um, and we do culture all positive molecular tests to verify um, and for sensitivity. So we did exactly the same thing. And uh, now that we've been up and running for a little over a year, uh, the physician staff really do like it. Um, but it was a little bit of a transition for them. Um, but we did it exactly the same way. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, do you batch enteric, the enteric panel, or do you run them as they're received? I believe this question um, is, came in during Dr. Albee's presentation. Uh, so we kind of batch them. Uh, so we will set up our kind of we will set up our blood auger plate, and we'll set up a you know there's a, a buffer tube uh, that the stool sample is supposed to go into. Uh, so as it's received, we set up our blood auger plate and we set up our buffer tube. Uh, that's stable for 12 hours. And so over the next 12 hours, uh, we'll kind of semi-batch those, uh, you know, taking down multiple at a time. Uh, but we make sure that they're run more or less, uh, you know, within that first 12 hours uh, of being received into the lab. And this is uh, Dr. McNabb. I do enteric panels. I know this wasn't for me, but um, we actually run them as they come into the laboratory. So we, we do them a little bit differently uh, because we do call positive results to the, to the emergency department and to pediatrics. So we, we set it up a little differently, but we were already doing that with our other testing, so we didn't find that to be a, we found that to be an actually an easier solution for our facility. Okay, great. Thank you very much for those answers. Uh, we've now reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. And if your question wasn't attended to during the Q&A session, the team from Nanosphere will do their best to follow up with you after the webinar. If you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Dr. McNabb, Susan Sable, and Dr. Alby by sharing this tweet that I've sent you all through the chat box. We hope you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.